Hey, what's up? My name is Grant Kenoki. I'm a singer, songwriter, producer, and artist, and you're listening to Power 98.5. We don't play the social game. We are social. Power 98.5. You're listening to Power 98.5, powered by United Angels Dream, your number one resource for public relations, entertainment, and multimedia. Contact them today at unitedangelsdream.com. Hi, this is Dan Aykroyd. He's progressive. He's beautiful. He's thoughtful. He's intelligent. He's powerful. He's positive. He is Stephen Cuoco on Power 98.5 Satellite Radio. Empowering listeners from the U.S. to the U.K. Live on air with Stephen Cuoco. I know you've all been paying attention to the social media. I know you've all been paying attention to what we've been blasting out. You've got that right. Josh Plassey, friend. And yes, I am very, very proud to call this young guy a friend. He is a talented actor, writer, producer. He's got so much going on. And we're going to get into it. Not only do you know him from iCarly, you know him from many other areas that I can just break down the list we've got coming out Baxter soon we've got flesh and blood which was a short American horror story Grey's Anatomy I mean this guy is gonna be mega even more all over the place I hope even in an upcoming Marvel movie how does that sound to you Josh you want to be in a Marvel movie <laughs> that sounds pretty darn good thank you Steven what an intro I mean, you can fill in for the Flash. You can fill in uh, maybe for <laughs> Thor. They can put a bodysuit on you or something. <laughs> <laughs> Give me 30 pounds of muscle and I'll be there. Hey, you, you never know. I mean, they do make muscle bodysuits. They do indeed. They do indeed. And hey, you know what? If We'll see what happens. Don't count it out. Maybe the Thor son is the new one. Very, very smart. The Thor son you know what? Very intelligent. Well, I just got to got done telling you, you look a little bit like uh, uh, Pauly Calafiore from Big Brother. I was like, wow, that's especially in your one headshot where you're like turned to the side. It's really nice headshot of you. I think you're wearing a white shirt. Yeah. You ever think about Thank that? you. You ever think about reality TV? Ever Have you ever tried out for reality television? I have never tried out for it. No, not once. Um, and I think, you know, as time progresses, I'm certainly open to anything. It would have to be something for me that speaks to me that I, you know, is something that could inspire people and uplift, uplift people and uh, would really grab my attention. Um, but like I said earlier, you know, I'm an open door man. So we'll just have to see what comes my way. Well, what's been coming your way is you're, you're back to writing again. Right? You're writing. Yes. Yep, you got it. Tell us a little bit about that. What type of project are you writing about right now? Um, there's a couple of things I'm doing right now. Uh, the two that I'm the most excited about, number one is called The Heat, and it's the true story about world champion boxer Chris Van Heerden from South Africa. He's a, a dear friend of mine and just an incredible human being. He's got one of the most inspiring stories you could ever hear about, uh, one of 13 children who just beat – every <laughs> obstacle and all of the odds you could possibly think about to become a world champion in the United States of America. And uh, he's actually going to be fighting September 7th in Madison, Madison Square Garden coming up here in, let's see, about three months. And can you take us a little bit more into what your plans are with that? Who's going to be part yeah. of the cast? I mean, what, what's the lineup? Absolutely. So we don't have we don't have anything crazy lined up at this moment just because there's quite a lot of options on the door. We've just finished the script. We're going to be going out right now to a couple of production companies that we're hoping to partner with. Um, but Chris himself is rather connected. So uh, we're hoping that, that have you ever seen by chance Whiplash? I, I have not heard of it. Tell me about it. Whiplash. It's a Miles Teller, J.K. Simmons film. It's probably one of my favorite films ever where J.K. Simmons is sort of an aggressive mentor to Miles Teller, but he sort of Miyagi's him throughout the entire film to become his best self. And the entire thing is about sort of greatness versus 
family. What do you, you know, who are you going to be? Sort of like the the Achilles story of uh, classic family versus greatness journey. And that's what we're doing with Chris's story right now in reality with his father who trained him since he was a five-year-old, literally, and put him through the ringer with uh, pretty intense stuff that uh, developed him into the man he is today. So in terms of the story itself, that sort of the main beat that I want to tell here. Um, it's a really incredible story about faith, if you will. His father had a vision for him when he was a young child that said he would be a world champion in the United States. And Chris obviously didn't believe that at age five. And uh, as they continued their story and as they continued their journey, ultimately, Chris actually lost his father uh, when he was about 26 years old. This is this is rather recent, actually. And he had never fulfilled what his father told him he was going to do. He had never fulfilled uh, becoming a world champion. And only a couple of years back after his father had passed, it had actually happened. Happen. And that's sort of the uh, end and the climax of the film for Chris's journey. It's it's so incredible. So uh, in terms of actual story beats, that's really what you're dealing with. And who's going to be in the film? Well, that, my friend, that remains to be seen. <laughs> I, I wish I had a, a great answer right now, but uh, we're, we're sort of up in the air. I would just say stay tuned and know that it's going to be huge. Well, I'm going to tell you that if you need a therapist, a counselor, an attorney, whatever it may be, I know I'm going to be getting the phone call because you're going to want me to fill that role. <laughs> you know I'm going to be, if you need a mentor in that movie, someone that's a, a facilitator, a leader, and that's going to be me. Absolutely. You're already, <laughs> you're on the, you're already on the short list. <laughs> short list. You mean I'm at the top of the list. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I, I don't Fair even enough. need to audition. You just give me the script. I'll learn it. Done. Done. Man. That's so funny, man. Yeah, we're doing that. And then um, the other project is called Yucca Valley, which is going to be a little it's going to be before Chris's story. We're actually doing that this uh, September in Oklahoma. It's going to be the first film that my production company does. We're incredibly excited. It's actually an occult horror thriller. It's pretty crazy and pretty out there. It's about the resurrection of Charles Manson in the modern day family. Wow. If they had still been around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's pretty dark, man. It's pretty dark, but it deals with some incredible themes. It's a little bit of theology in there. And ultimately it's a story of redemption for a young woman who's born into the family and uh, goes through quite a journey. I really hope with the, with this film, with Charles Manson, I've seen some of, you know, the Sharon Tate, a lot of those uh, remakes, um, yes, I hope with this one, Josh, that it really turns out to really capture who Charles Manson is, because I feel like any films that were done, it seemed a bit lackluster, like it was something that I already knew, but it didn't feel like there was really any dimension to the way Charles Manson was presented, if that makes sense. I completely agree. Absolutely. I completely agree. And if you're going to do it, you have to do it right. You have to do the. You have to go into it. You have to study it. You have to portray it as it was. And I think one of the interesting things for me, at least, is psychologically, is the impact that he has on other people. And a lot of stories that have been told about Manson are kind of just classic horror movies, if you will, where, you know, he's walking through the desert and he tells some people to do something bad and ultimately they execute it. And there's just nothing there. There's no depth. There's no three dimensionality to the characters. And what's intriguing to me is, is, and this is why we have a female protagonist in the film is because of the way that he was able to manipulate them in real life and the psychology that it goes through with that. I mean, he, he actually had a book from Dale Carnegie called how to win friends and influence people. And if you listen to actual interviews of him, this book was sort of his mantra about how he would essentially cry and just uh, manipulate young women who had family issues, who had drug addictions, you name it. And so we're really diving into that psychology with the film. And I think it's going to be very interesting and a breath of fresh air. How do you plan to obtain information? I mean, like real information about Charles Manson that you can go into the world. And I know you mentioned about this book, but I mean, are you going to look into listening to past audio that has been published online? Uh, find oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a great question. Um, absolutely, man. And we, we have, we've done a lot of that. There are, I'll say countless, countless audio tapes. There's articles, there have been numerous books, and then there's actual recountments from members of the family that we actually picked up and purchased. And they go rather in depth, actually, with how, how they were treated, why they loved Manson. And the, the craziest part about it all is that even today, 60 years later, these, these people are reflecting upon their times with a positive outlook. 
that, 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 you know, spawn ranch and their time there was genuinely relieving to them from their life. And it's, it's really, it's really incredible to see that and sort of the allure of these cults, uh, even, even today, you know, from heaven's gate to the Manson family, there's always a, seems to be a constant variable there that these people are escaping a much worse version of life. The reality that their, their home front was really dark and these sort of predatorial, you know, we'll call them fake messiahs as they pitch themselves, always open their arms and preach this sort of, Hey, you know, life's going to be good with me. And then it ultimately goes wrong. So yes, the short answer is we've had a number of, uh, of books, articles, tapes, um, you name it. Something just came to me. Do you consider this? Do you believe that when it comes to Charles Manson and the influence he had, would you ever consider if not including it into this film, but into a future, say, mini docu-series about how, and this this would be my question, how does Charles Manson and his influence correlate in today's society and its teachings? Now, that, that was a little bit of a title that I gave you there. Because when you think of Charles Manson and take out the fact of what happened with the murders, not that it wasn't important, but when you look about the manipulation and the influence, when you think about big pharma companies, social media companies, Facebook, Google, all of this stuff, the, the big, huge monopolies that are out there, what social media does uh, to people's mental state of being, their mental health, I really don't see that much of a difference. I look at today's society, if you really think about it, since we're on this topic, once again, when we think about the manipulation, when we think about the coercion, when we think about followers, when we think about influencers who, who are supposedly influential, give me your honest opinion. Does it really separate when you think of Charles Manson as a singular person who affected the masses? Does it really make a difference or is there a similarity of what we live in today's society? Is today's society really a huge mass cult governed by huge political and corporate businesses and their mindset of the people that run them? Oof. Oh, man, you took it there. <laughs> it, it really just came through me to where that would be very interesting to where it's it's the association yeah. is just very, very similar. Yeah, because no, absolutely. Here, real quick, if I may say, when you think about yeah. murdering, yeah, there is the the specific act of murdering, but some, but what about murdering your soul? What about murdering your identity? What about killing your person and personality when you think about numbers and validation and how so many people are struggling with mental illness, addiction, suicide, um, reckless behavior, because they're, they are challenged and they are led to believe that in order to kill themselves or a part of themselves to adapt to to be able to conform to uh what is considered maybe a sense of proper socialization where's the difference yeah no you bring up a very interesting point my friend a very interesting point um you know I would say that you are right. Um, there isn't a crazy difference on a large scale. Obviously, um, you know, the, like you said right off the get-go, the line becomes when you, you know, murder. Obviously, when you take it there and, and you, you take it to an extreme of which you're breaking the law, that's the obvious, the obvious line. But in terms of similarities in the correspondence between the two, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the bottom line, at least as I see it, is that people they want escapism people who are in really dark places they they fluctuated to these cults back then because they didn't have anything else and that's how manson was able to prey on these young women and, and even some of these young men is that for for them they believed everything he was preaching he actually told people he was the messiah he told people he was jesus the second coming and he he was able to get into the heads of these individuals so much so that they were ready to leave everything else behind and i think that for a lot of them they didn't have much worth worth losing and so today to compare that with these social media companies and a lot of the things that you're talking about it's sort of that um that escapism as, as our as our word here in the sense of people who um are 
trying to get away from something else in their everyday life. You know what I mean? Um, people who are unhappy, whether that's their job, whether that's their family front, whether that's their, their, uh, holistic outlook on life. You talked about suicide. You talked about a lot of these, you know, issues with depression and anxiety. And today it can feel so overwhelming that people want to find escapism in something. And so for them, they, they put that in whatever that might be, uh, that, you know, Instagram for 10 hours a day. Uh, you talked about big pharmaceutical companies, um, you, you know, using people, you talked about politics. I think it's all relative, man. I think you may bring a very good point. And for me, it just comes down to escapism. And that's so many people living such dark and tumultuous times that they want to put, they want to put their hope in something else. And they want to, they want to sort of escape into a separate reality. And with Manson and with all of these cults, that's exactly what they pitch. They pitch a separate reality. And with Instagram, with Facebook, with all of these things, with Twitter, you name it, when you're on there and you're really scrolling and you're really doing your thing, I mean, if you truly pay attention, it's you're just 20 minutes. It's 25 minutes you've been scrolling. And I know people might say that's not true, but if you really pay attention, go look at your screen time. I dare you to go look at how long you've spent on your screen. It's an innate amount of time. And for us, that's our form of escapism. So if, if these companies are pumping slowly but surely, I mean, we're getting into a Orwellian 1984 type of conversation here. But if these companies are pumping one source of information at you slowly but surely through these, let's say, Instagram, let's say Twitter, let's say all these companies, and that's all you're being exposed to, then you're absolutely right, man. That's the exact same thing as what, as what these cults were doing. That's the exact same theology as what Charles Manson was saying, as what, you know, you named Heaven's Gate earlier, any of these things. It's really the exact same sort of principle. I'm not saying Instagram is Charles Manson here, by the way, but you, <laughs> you get my, you get my point. I do. Uh, it's definitely the same thing. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. And when you think about it, uh, from the the stories and the the audio, and especially the films I had seen on Charles Manson, very selective when it came to information, and when it came to the validity and the truth of the information and how it was distorted. Isn't that what we deal with every day? So true. So, so true. You're absolutely right. Again, that's kind of what I was trying to allude to is that if, if there's only one source, yep. <laughs> then there you go. Isn't it and interesting? That, it really is, man. And back then they had no technology. You know what I mean? They weren't able to just get on and put in escape, if you will. So they found these other alternative means. And today, we, you know, we think we're so far ahead in advance by just burying our heads in our phones, but ultimately it's not that different. Nope. And then you have the subliminal messages and music, uh, within performance, uh, you know, action. It's, it's quite interesting. Uh, I, it, you know, like I told you, we'll see how this unfolds. Like I always do with interviews and, you know, I never thought we would have some type of intellectual conversation about Charles Manson and how it relates to <laughs> how we live every day in society and how, you know, the, the, the bigger people that believe that they are the powers that be who pick and choose what is truth and what is real, or maybe, you know, a, a farce of, uh, reality. Uh, when you really think about it, what really separates them from these mass murderers? I agree. Outside of murder itself, outside, as we said earlier, outside of these illegal actions, no, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. there, there's not much separating them. They're trying to perpetuate their agenda. These occult leaders are trying to perpetuate their agenda. And generally speaking, it's for their own good. It's, it's you know, fi uh, for financial or fiscal gain. It's for uh, a position of power, a uh, position of self-worth, and it's the exact same. So I completely agree with you. In, in, in that in that note or on that note for what you're doing and, and it is incredible. And I really would love to see you do something uh, really in this industry that is transformative. I know that you can do it. I know that you can pull it off and I know you will be able to deliver the message very elegantly and effectively uh, because you're just that talented to where you you're very balanced. So I, I definitely look Thank forward you. to you coming. You're very welcome, Josh, uh, for these projects in the future. Definitely consider, and I believe you will be recognized for being uh, a leader and someone well, that is guiding the way to uh, be able to give people a, 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 an opportunity to relate, but also find a sense of hope that, you know, my grandfather always said, for every thought that you have, someone else has the same exact thought. And I didn't question that, Josh, but I have learned 
throughout four decades that it is the truth. Someone out there does in some way, shape, or form can relate to your way of thinking. And imagine the people that you would end up helping because there's a difference between power and empowerment. And I like to say that when you think of power, think of um, electricity, okay? Well, mm -hmm. you ha you're, you're generating electricity. That's power. Well, empowerment are the wires. They're the towers. They're the electronics that you use, what you use power for, turning on your TV, your cell phones, recharging things. So once again, power is just the body of the substance, or the I thing. love that. But true empowerment is the purpose of what does it lead lead into? How does it get utilized? What does it get used for? And what does it help and aid us in? It gives us light. It gives us heat. So you have the ability of empowering people by taking facts, which is power, and then facilitate that through the means of word, because you are a brilliant writer, word, film, anything whatsoever, you can do this. Wow. Thank you, Stephen. That, uh, that means the world, my brother. And I completely agree with your grandfather's statement. Um, I think so as well. My dad is a uh, Navy SEAL, former Navy SEAL, no longer active duty. And he, uh, he said something very similar, although it wasn't about thoughts. It was that, um, you know, for everything that you do, someone out there does it better. And uh, that serves for a lot of things. That serves as um, inspiration to be better. That serves as a message in humility to know that there's always someone out there doing it just as good as you are. Don't get too big for your britches. And so I, I think that what you're saying is directly in line with a lot of what I've been taught too. And um, I think that uh, if, if done, if done correctly, um, entertainment in general, what I'm trying to do out here, both with writing, producing and acting and creating a platform, I, I believe it can really serve in a big way. Everything you just said, I think it can empower people. I think it can uplift people. And, uh, if we're successful in that, man, then I'll be a very happy, a very happy gentleman. <laughs> Take us into now, you know, to, to bounce off of producing, writing, acting, I, Carly, and Baxter's, where do you want to begin with this? Because this is very yeah. detailed, and there's a lot going on here with these two components. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, so I, Carly, uh, is the most recent one, so I suppose I'll start there. Um, I was incredibly fortunate to be on the final three episodes of the first season of The New Revival. Um, I can't give uh, crazy details since the episodes haven't dropped yet, but I can, of course, speak with you about most of it. Um, I play uh, Carly, Carly Shea, Miranda Cosgrove's boyfriend, in the last three episodes. Um, and the season ends with a nice cliffhanger between a lot of what's going on. And I can just say that the experience was so fun. <laughs> it's just, just absolutely amazing. It's a multi-camera comedy, which was the first time I'd been exposed to that. I've primarily worked in drama, as you mentioned earlier, Grey's Anatomy and American Horror Story, Feud, uh, Criminal Minds, shows like that that I've done. But this was the first time I've ever been on a uh, multi-camera sitcom. And it's just such a different world. It's so much fun, man. It really brought out my inner child. It allowed me to laugh, to smile, and, and take the craft seriously, but also remember that, you know, we're here making entertainment. We're here having fun. And uh, the entire thing was so interesting to me because of the way they shoot. They do one episode a week, and the first three days are actually just blocking. You do a, you do a network run-through and a studio run-through, kind of a producer run-through, if you will, to sort of test to make sure everything's working. And then they make rewrites on the script itself. And they do you know, a blue revision, a yellow revision, a table read, et cetera, a table revision, excuse me, and then a, a shooting draft. And so these actors on these shows, I mean, it's incredible. They're getting redrafts the night before they're shooting. It's almost like a soap opera in the sense that they, they, they have to memorize, especially Carly, because she's the lead of the show. She has to memorize, you know, 50 pages worth of rewrites. It's, it's incredible. Um, so that was really, really fun and really interesting. And, you know, you spend all this time working on a joke, working on your comedic timing and your relationships to the other characters. And then the next day it's different. <laughs> so it really keeps you on your toes and, um, and just allows you to be free and more in the moment. And so I, I have to say it was probably the most fun that I've ever had on any show. Um, I just thought the cast was incredible. The crew was amazing. The energy was so great. We shot on the studio at the soundstage down at Paramount. 
And um, I just thought that everyone was cohesive and fun. There was never a, never a dull moment. And sometimes on sets you get one person or two, maybe even two who, um, you know, are having a bad day and, and that energy spreads like wildfire, man. And, and there was just not, there was none of that. It was absolutely incredible. So should I come back to the show? Um, I would be, I would be a very happy man. You belong there anyway. And if you don't, you'll have something else, whether it's your project or someone else's project, you're going to be on something. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I've got a, a couple things uh, in, in the works recently that I was up for and a couple more auditions coming up this week. Uh, and, you know, it's ever flowing. So I, I think something will, will hit very soon. And I appreciate that. Lead us into Baxter's. Now we're talking about a, a, you were on 32 episodes. Correct. Yep. All right. Take us into that, because this was a project that was done, what, like two years ago? That's now yes. coming out? Yeah, yeah. So this was a project that was done two years ago. It's based on a literary series, actually, from a woman named Karen Kingsbury, and she sold over 36 million copies of the novels. So it's got huge IP, a great audience. We did 32 episodes uh, shot here in L.A., and uh, because of the pandemic and a number of other reasons, uh, it hasn't aired quite yet. And then it's an MGM show. And I don't know if you've heard, but recently Amazon acquired MGM in a pretty much a mega deal. I can't remember the exact figures, but I think it was just south of $9 billion. Wow. So they have to go through. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. I think I think it was $8.45 billion. And so Amazon now owns pretty much all the um, property that MGM once had, and so they're gonna have they're gonna have to go through an entire you know transition and acquisitions period before that's done. But uh, once they've done that and Amazon makes announcements, we'll know exactly where the show is gonna land. But as of this moment right now, uh, we're just waiting to see where that home is. And man, I am so excited to uh, have everyone see this one. It's it's pretty awesome. Uh, and again, like you said earlier, I was on 32. So it was it's obviously the biggest show that I've done for me. Uh, my character is really fun. I play Luke Baxter. I am the only son within a family of five daughters. <laughs> it's just uh, really a fun thing. And uh, I got to work with Roma Downey, who plays my mother. She's just amazing. She's uh, touched by an angel. So many other shows. Um, Ted McGinley plays my father. He's probably one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. Uh, and then the entire cast, you know, without, without rounding out too many names is just fantastic. Um, it, it was really a, a blessing. And one of the, one of the crazier things that actually happened, which sort of never happens out here in Hollywood is that one of my best friends named Jake Allen, he's my writing partner for a number of my uh, things we've done already. He was actually cast in the show as well. So <laughs> we literally had our, uh, and he's a series, we were both series regulars, which is incredibly rare. So the two of us were able to um, pal out and just have fun on set for, you know, months. And uh, it was just incredible. I'm pausing because it's like, <laughs> you're the first person I've interviewed in a very long time that's got, this is since the pandemic during you've got like back to back have you been like on pause at all or you just got all this going on at the same time in the last year and a half <laughs> i'm i'm kind of a weirdo with my work ethic man i've got too i've got too much going on but it's all a good thing you, you should see my office it's like a freaking beautiful mind in here just boards on boards and uh just trying to attack every angle we can you know um I, i'm hungry i'm ready and no there hasn't been a pause and I'll tell you what, I will have one at the end of the year because I am getting married in December. What? Yeah. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> Seriously. Really? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's crazy. I'm 27, but I, uh, I've i been with the same woman for 12 years. We grew up wow. in Virginia together, and uh, we are tying the knot in December. Congratulations. Wow. I tell you, you, you uh, millennials, you love to get married young. <laughs> Feel young. All of my friends are kids. It's like they're all married with like two, three kids already. You guys gonna be having a kid then soon too? Hey, who knows? We'll see. We'll see. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna take some time. I think we're gonna take some time. But you know, uh, I, I don't want to answer that one. I'll let her do it. <laughs> all right. Uh, just just be prepared. Cause listen, like I, I I support you. Like you've got my total support. The family, the white picket fence. I mean, the whole you know, uh, Smallville type of uh, fairy tale. But you remember your projects. Don't let Absolutely. anything distract you. Even a puppy. I mean, come on now. You guys start thinking: Is that puppy when you got? Especially, you know, you got to put into that. <laughs> what are you gonna He's do about crazy. The writing? Yeah. Wait a minute. You do have a dog, don't you? I do. I have a two-year-old Siberian Husky, oh, and he never is mind. insane. <laughs> he, he's going to be a puppy for the next 10 years. 
<laughs> yep, exactly. All right. I run this guy, uh, and I'm not even kidding. I'm not being sarcastic here. I'd say I run him at least five miles a day, and he goes to the park, and he still has unlimited energy. Oh, yeah, another 10, 15 years. Those dogs, that breed, yeah, they forever stay young. And you're doing <laughs> all of this. You're, you're doing all of this, 27, going to be married in December. You've got iCarly, Baxter's, you're writing, film, research, you know, Charles Manson, now that I gave you another, at least two new documentary films that you can bounce yep. off of, <laughs> social media and world influence, or combine them both together. I mean, what else? Wow, yeah, no, I appreciate you, Stephen. Wow, yeah, I mean, my, my ultimate, you know, I have a lot of aspirations and goals, but ultimately I would love to establish my own production company here within the next five years or so, uh, which is why we're trying to make this film right now and, um, you know, get competitive, get out there, make, make movies that, that have meaning, man. At the end of the day, um, I, you know, we talked about Charles Manson, obviously, and that sounds like it, it might not have meaning, but there's a, there's a deep rooted message at the core. And, and that's what it's about for me is, is at the end of the day with entertainment, making content that matters. I, I don't, I don't ever want to just put out something to make a buck or put out something be, as just, you you know, pure escapism for a Sunday night. I, I would like to make films that speak to people. Um, you know, a, a good example that I have is probably my favorite probably my favorite television show of all time is the first season of true detective. And at the end of true detective, uh, I think it's the best scene ever written in cinema history when, um, uh, Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson, you know, you, you've gone through the entire journey. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, Woody looks up to the sky and he says, you know, it looks like the darkness has a lot more territory. And then uh, Matthew McConaughey, you know, rolls out on his wheelchair and, <laughs> and he says, uh, yeah, but, you know, everything started as darkness. And to me, it seems like it's getting a little bit lighter. And when I heard that moment, as you know, I was five, 10 years ago watching that show, I just was like, oh, my gosh, that's what it's all about right there, man. It's getting a little bit lighter. And, and the showrunner, the, the the writer, the producers, everyone involved, they, they put out a it's subliminal. They didn't hit you over the head with it, but they put out a message that matters. And and uh, the show was just so incredible the entire time. It was interesting how they, they used darkness, but then really ended it on a light message. So for me, that's what it's all about, man, making content like that that speaks to people. You told me, you said, I think that mindsets and anything related are always fun topics of discussion. Yes. What I take from that is it's all about teaching and learning all at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. Take us. I back. think. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do you think? No, no, no. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Steve. No, go ahead. I know what I'm going to ask you. <laughs> oh, well, then, well then, then ask away. Ask away. Yeah. I wasn't sure. Uh, all right. So you're 27 and I was going to go back a little bit because one of the proud moments I wanted to touch up on, and if you want to recap or share or finish what you were about to say, um, is that you had won the Golden Gloves at the age of 18. Like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. With, with that happening, how does that translate to where you're at now? Or what did you learn at 18 winning the Golden Gloves? Because you're heavily into sports. Yes. Yes. Um, I learned a lot. Absolutely, man. And I think... I think a lot of successful entertainers uh, came from an athletic background because sports teach you so much. They breed so much into you. And for me, with boxing and Golden Gloves in particular, um, I played football as a kid uh, all the way up through high school, and I loved it. But ultimately, it, it was a team sport where someone else you know, determines your destiny, and that's great. I, football is probably my favorite sport out there. But I found that um, for me, I wanted something where it was just me. I controlled my destiny, and, and really that comes down to um, – boxing wrestling <laughs> combat sports generally and so I, I transitioned and um and i learned so much in that man because the preparation that it takes both mentally and physically and even spiritually and emotionally to a degree to really get in that ring and stand across from another human being with you know one possible outcome is uh is is incredibly teaching for you as a youngster and so for me i, I took everything that i learned from that i had so many great mentors and teachers and trainers who instilled these mindsets into me that I've brought out here. I mean, I, I was I was training three times a day, every single day with, with midnight runs and early morning rises. And when you take that level of work ethic and you apply it to the entertainment industry, I think you can be an unstoppable force because nobody does that. And that's what's so interesting about acting and about writing and about producing is that if you're out here and you don't have a structure, 
you're going to go nowhere because people, it's not a nine to five. So people don't make, they don't make time. They just say, oh, well, I had an audition today. So I'm an actor. Sure. You are. I'm not taking that away from you. But if you really want to move forward and everything, you need to be working a nine to five plus another, in my opinion, four hours to get ahead because there are so many people out here trying to do this. It's the most competitive industry in the world. And now if you're an American with the emergence of self tapes, you're competing with the Aussies, the Brits, everyone in the world. And so for me with, with boxing, how that translated was I started boxing a little bit late. I, I, I didn't come into the game until, you know, I boxed a little bit growing up with my dad, but I started late and I, I always envisioned it as a highway. We were talking about mindsets and I thought, okay, if I'm this far behind and these top percent boxers are driving 100 miles an hour, metaphorically speaking, then I have to drive 200 miles an hour. And so I took that mindset and I did. I drove 200 miles an hour every single day and it, it ended up with me being victorious. And so when I moved out to Hollywood, I, I was 21 and that's incredibly late, believe it or not. Um, and it's, it's completely possible to do that. Many people have been successful, but in my opinion, I was far behind. And so I actually applied that exact same mindset. I said, okay, here's the highway. I'm very far behind. I haven't been on a Disney show as a kid. I have, I have no relationships out here. I have no experience. I know no one. It's literally just me in the biggest city in America. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to drive 200 miles an hour. So I did. I hit the ground running. Um, I was in three boxing, or, excuse me, I was in three acting classes. I was a full-time student in college. I was teaching boxing on the side, working at a restaurant. Uh, it, it was it was madness. So my point in all that is saying that the boxing mindset that I had learned and adapted served me so well in the entertainment industry. And if anyone's out here hearing this, I would I would highly encourage you to to, to adapt sort of a sports mentality into your your writing and your acting and your producing because without it. There's just no structure, and it's really easy to sit around and fool yourself into thinking that you're working hard. Excellent point. Excellent, excellent point. And a reason why it's all about what I hear is conditioning. It, you know, we can always do more than just eat eat correctly or eat to our blood type and exercise. It, the number one question to ask yourself every day is how are you conditioning yourself emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, or, you know, all the yeah. above? That's the takeaway. That's the golden gem that I got from your your share in that moment. I love that. I love that, man. Very, very well said. Very well said. So speaking of conditioning, are you still active at the age of 27 just as much as you were when you were 18 in sports? Or what are you doing to condition yourself now in the midst of once you're getting married in December? Shout out to Kristen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Kirsten. Yep, yep. All right, Kirsten. Kirsten, perfect, perfect. Kirsten, Kirsten, you got not, it. Not Kirsten, it's Kirsten. It's Kirsten. Kirsten. I know she's got a she's got a great little name. All right, I, I like so. Shout out to Kirsten. I pay attention. I do my research. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> I can tell. So thank you. You're welcome. An upcoming marriage, twenty seventh December to Kirsten. Uh, you know, film projects, writing, dog, five mile run. Is this your way of, of conditioning to, to stay balanced and centered and fulfilled, or are there other aspects and components that we would love to know about and hear about that you're doing that could be helpful even to, to someone like myself or those that are listening that we may not have considered? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I think there's a number of, of things. For, for me, faith plays a big part in my life. And um, I think everyone, you know, what, no matter what your faith is, no matter what you believe, um, for, for me, uh, I'm a Christian and, and waking up every morning and spending time in the Bible. And that, that can be applied to anything. That can be applied to any religion. That can be applied to any mindset. Just really taking some slow time before you begin your day. And for me, praying and, and reading the Bible and starting off very slow and very appreciative. I think that's the key there is just being uh, appreciative for everything that I have, thanking God and really trying to have a conversation with him. Um, after about 30 minutes in the morning, every morning, I conclude and I just feel so ready for the rest of the day. Uh, I think it's it's a completely different thing. I wake up and I make my bed and then I go and I pray. And I, I think that, uh, you know, you, you can take what you will from that and apply that however, but 30 minutes of silent time, whether that's spiritual for you or emotional, and just really reflecting and being grateful for what you have, I think that it's a really nice balancing act. Um, and I think it's a good way to start your day every single morning. What's your favorite scripture? What, what, what really, oh. yeah, I mean, it, like, if, if you have one or what comes to your mind that if 
let me direct it this way. If you were to be in a place of confusion, doubt, and uncertainty, what would either be the first scripture or quote, what would come to your mind to help? I love that. I love that. That's a great question. And I, I, I absolutely all day, second Corinthians five, seven for me, which says, uh, we walk by faith, not sight. And I think that I'm so, I'm so glad you asked that question because whether you're a Christian, whether you're, you're, um, whether you're anything, obviously you can be a non-believer, you can be a different religion. I think that this, this particular scripture is applicable for everyone. We walk by faith, not sight. And for me, that's so incredibly needed when you're in the entertainment industry, because 99% of the time, sight looks really bad. <laughs> you're, it, out of 100 auditions, you might get 99 no's. Out of 100 days, 90 of them might be awful. Uh, out of you know 100 scripts that you write or 100 pages, whatever that might be, right? most of them are going to be bad. You're going to have to tear them up and rewrite. You're going to get feedback that's, that's dim, and people are going to tell you that you're not good, that you should leave. And when if you just look at things from a, a bland, you know, human standpoint, it's really, really discouraging. And that that verse for me, we walk by faith, not sight, that encompasses everything that drives me every single day because I know in my life that Jesus has a plan for me. And so that faith that I have in that plan, I don't have to look at things on a daily standpoint because I know that no matter what, it's gonna work out well. So I, for me, I would say that scripture is is um, is an answer for everyone. That is a beautiful, beautiful testimony, and I'm going to say finishing of a incredible interview. Uh, we're not going to cut this too short yet. We are going to start to close out, but thank you for that. I mean, for for what it's worth, Josh, that that was something that I, that I needed to hear. Wow! So thank yeah. you. Repeat thank that. Thank you, Stephen. Repeat that one more time again because it deserves repeating. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith, not sight. Because if you let yourself walk by sight, you're going to be sad. You're going to be discouraged because the world is dark, man. And most days are hard. But if you walk by faith, you trust in God's plan for your life, you're going to be a happy individual. And and here's why I wanted you to ask to see if there was something else there that, that could be taken away. How many times do people put expectations on themselves and don't see they do not see every single day the fruits of their labor, the rewards that they think they should have earned or have gotten, or to have gotten that phone call or that letter in the mail or whatever it may be that you've got the part, you got the role, you know, you got the so job. So true. So true, man. So true. Very well said. Every You're right. All the time. It's constant. It's constant. And it, we want instant gratification, but instant gratification is unfulfilling. When you actually earn something and you take time for it, it's going to be so much more rewarding. And I think that you just can't, you can't let the daily failures and the daily struggles get you down. You just have to trust in a larger and bigger plan. And you have to be honest with yourself about how badly you want it. And if you truly believe you're meant to do it, because if you truly, truly believe you're meant to do it, God will give it to you. But if you, if you're not meant to do it, you're going to find yourself walking by sight every day. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in the emotional, mental strength and resiliency to be able to, to be and live in your truth in that way, in that manner. Yes. That is yes. another thing that, that may not be. It's, I would say that like some, sometimes people will say, well, you're not ready. You're not ready. It may not just be that you're not ready. Or it may not be that you're not ready at all. It may be that you don't have enough faith in yourself. Maybe you're not believing enough in God to that because you're still being fearful of, mm -hmm. of the situation that you're fearing that you're not in control or you're fearing that you're not good enough and you need to create a, a, a persona, uh, a temporary persona or, or some type of sense of being to accommodate other people to give them the illusion that you're ready or that you're capable that you can get that role you can do that role you can do that job so it's just really looking and searching yourself and figuring out and finding uh what your truth is is to you know is it really a no is the door really closed or is it because your idea of what you think is meant for you and what you earn and deserve and have the right to is not something that you're really conditioned for. Remember, conditioning. 
so true. So well said, man. Yeah, that's that's very very well point. I agree with you 100%. Um and and uh I think that's re- those are wise words, man. And um I think that if people can can really grasp what you just said and I think that's going to affect a lot of listeners because um we're often walking down one road and that door might shut and we might think that's a bad thing, but an, an even bigger door opens just to the left of it. Who would you like to give a shout out to? <laughs> uh my mom kelly plassey well kelly gaskill now oh, okay. and uh and kirsten my fiance soon to be wife kirsten hauser give a shout out to her any any golden gems I, you dropped a lot i carly baxter's writing um upcoming film projects is there anything else that you want to give to us or share with us before we close out today that we can look forward to from you or even any fun, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, running, or if you're going to be playing, anything at all. Man, um, I would say there's a chance that I will, in a small capacity, get back in the ring at the end of this year in an amateur in an amateur fashion. So I would say pay attention to that if that should happen. Before you get married or after. Uh, before I get married a decent amount of time before, just in case. <laughs> just make sure you don't lose any teeth. You got wedding photos coming up. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, that's it for me, man. What, it, what would be the go-to TikTok, Instagram, website, IMDB? Where do you want people to go to find you, book you? What's the, what's the number one place to go or all the places? Just go ahead and, and give our listeners uh, everywhere and anywhere yeah. that you want them to be. I'm a simple guy. I'm Instagram and IMDb. If you're in the industry, you know, IMDb is always easy and good for, for everyone else and the listeners. Instagram is really the only thing that I'm active on. I love Instagram. I'm starting to try to take it a little bit more seriously and post more frequently and share a little bit more about my life. So uh, Instagram would be the one for me. Yeah, your Instagram's looking great and definitely could use a lot more, uh, a lot more content and not because you're lacking the content. I would say because your content really is that good, it's that personable, I would say for you being a writer, a producer, an actor, and creator, uh, this really illustrates, like I would think a casting director or producer or director would would want to, if not hire you, or I would say definitely hire you, but let's say to, to be very neutral on this, hire you or the desire of, I want to get to know this guy. I want to get to know this mm. Josh. Your Instagram speaks that. It's it's very, very balanced with uh, the feeling of lifestyle, yet educational, yet professional. Very, very well done. So with you pacing and choosing the content correctly, it works. Even a post uh, with you back on uh, September 19, 2019, in order to really enjoy a dog, one doesn't merely <laughs> try to train him to be a semi-human. The point of it is to open oneself to the possibility of becoming partly a dog. And that's uh, <laughs> uh, what you wrote uh, by Edward Hoagland, the little guy. Has, you. It, it, yep, you got it. So, I mean, like right there, like with your, your husky, your baby, it's, it's very lifestyle but yeah, it blends so well to who you are as a, as a creator. Thank you. Wow. That's, that's awesome, man. That's, that's really good to hear. You've given me insight and you're vastly more knowledgeable than myself on social media. So that's really inspiring to hear. And I'm, I'm, I'm striving to get better at it every day. Very well done. And to read a quote by you on Instagram and greater is the one living inside me than he who is living in the world. I love that. Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> what, what, made, what made you put that on there? What inspired you to, uh, of all the things you could have placed in your bio, why that? Uh, that is a line from a song from Mercy Me. And I think it encapsulates what I'm trying to get across to, get across to everyone, which is uh, simply that anything that I do, if it's good, um, it's coming from someone bigger than me. <laughs> Josh, Pla- that's it. 
let me thank you very much for being here. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Live on Air with Stephen Cuoco on Power 98.5 Satellite Radio. We are in 39 countries. I want to thank everyone who has tuned in on the iOS and Android app, radio.com, the Power 98.5 webpage, Alexa, writer, producer, actor, and an all-around incredible, incredible young man who's about to get married in December to his fiance Kirsten. Or Kirsten, I'm sorry, Kirsten. And, uh, his beautiful husky running five miles a day, writing a project coming up, Charles Manson related. Uh, I'm adding two docu-series about how it relates to social media, life, and, and people's mental health, because I know you're going to to uh, accommodate those projects very well. Love to I see love those at Sundance Film Festival. And, and let me, you will win awards. You will win them with your Absolutely. work. Absolutely. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. What a pleasure and what an honor this has been, man. Truly, I hope you uh, have me back on one day. You will come back on anytime you want. Anything you want to discuss seriously, this is your home. Stay on the line. We're going to close out Josh. Josh Plassey, once again, you can connect with him on Instagram. You can connect with him on the IMDb. Josh, J-O-S-H, Plassey, P-L-A-S-S-E. Anything you want to final, fi like in, in your final thought, want to say before we head on out of here? No, my final thought is simply for you. It's just thank you, Stephen, for having me. Thank you for creating this amazing channel. And um, thank you for everyone who's listening. I mean, I just think this is fantastic. And I hope that uh, you all continue to tune in because I know Stephen has big plans for future guests and everything else that he's doing. And you're going to be one of those right back on here, Josh. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Stay on the line. We're going to close out. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Power 98.5. You know where to find us. We've got all the best. Come on, Josh Plassey. We've got, we had Andrew Gray. We've got more people coming. This is your home. Celebrity News. Socials and let's connect.